Right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is now 18.30 South African time. Welcome to lecture three of Cricket South Africa's level three umpiring course presented by Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. My name is Tom Mokorossi. I will be taking you through the revision questions from Monday, and then I will take you through law 20, which is dead ball. And then I'll hand over to my co-presenter, Abdullah Stienkamp, who will take us through laws 21, 22, and then he shall take us through the revision questions for this evening's presented material. Revision questions from Monday involved the last hour. The last hour starts at 1700 hours. At 1710, after 2.2 overs have been bowled, there is a rain interruption. Play resumes at 17.23. Show step-by-step -step calculations to determine how many overs remain to be bowled in the last hour. So law tells us that the minimum overs in the last hour that need to be bowled are 20. In our example, we have lost 13 minutes from 17.10 till 17.23. Remember that because we need to bowl a minimum of 20 overs in an hour, it means that an over is three minutes. So how do we calculate our overs lost? We take the 13 minutes lost divided by three. And for every full three minutes that we have lost time, then we shall lose an over. So 13 divided by 3 is a, a full 4 overs for every 3 minutes. And the extra 0.33 there, uh, we do not add an over. Okay, so we want more cricket, so we only lose 4 overs. So overs to be bold, overs that have been bold, two overs and two balls. So we start with 20 overs. We bold 2.2 overs. We lost four overs. So we are left with 13.4 overs, which is 13 overs and four balls. Next revision question, also about the last hour. This time we have a change of innings in the last hour. The last hour starts at 1700 hours. At 1719, after five overs have been bowled, Team A is bowled out with Team B now requiring 64 runs to win the match. Show step-by-step -step calculations to determine how many overs remain to be bowled in the last hour. Law tells us that if an innings ends after the last hour has started, two calculations are required. The greater of the numbers yielded by these two calculations is to be the minimum number of overs to be bowled in the new innings. So what are these two calculations? The first calculation is based on overs remaining. At the conclusion of the innings, the number of overs that remain to be bowled in the last hour need to be noted. If it is a whole number, sorry, if it is not a whole number, that number is to be rounded up to the next whole number. So if there were 14.2 overs left, then we would round that to 15 overs left as an example. Then we will deduct three overs for the change of innings. And that will determine the number of overs to be bowled. So in our example, we started with 20 overs. 
we bowled five overs. And so five were remaining before the change of innings. The change of innings is a deduction of three overs. So the calculation based on overs remaining comes to a total of 12 overs left to be bowled. Okay, let's keep that in mind to compare to the second calculation. The second calculation is based on time remaining. So at the conclusion of the innings, the time remaining until the agreed time for the close of play is to be noted. Then of course there is 10 minutes for the change of innings interval that needs to be deducted from this time to determine the playing time remaining. A calculation to be made of one over for every complete three minutes of playing time remaining, plus one more over if any part of three minutes remains. So let's put that theory into practice. Our last hour is supposed to be from 1700 hours to 1800 hours. The time remaining at the interval is 1800 hours minus 1719, which is 41 minutes, uh, less the 10 minutes for the change of innings leaves us with 31 minutes of playing time. 31 divided by 3 gives us uh, 10 whole overs, which are 30 minutes, plus 1 over for the 1 minute of the next 3 minutes, okay, which is 11 overs. We had a bit of consternation about this point in the lecture on Monday. So what we need to understand is any part of three minutes constitutes an over, even if it's not a complete three minutes. This is so that we gain more cricket. So the calculation based on time remaining came to 11 overs. Remember that the calculation based on overs remaining came to 12 overs. So we use the greater of the two calculations and that is 12 overs for our answer. Okay, but you obviously need to show in the exam the calculation of both methods. Question three is to do with a follow-on. Team A scores 600 in their first innings of a three-day provincial match. They bowl out Team B for 450 runs in their first innings. The captain of Team A informs you that he wants Team B to follow on. What is your response? By now we should all know that the minimum lead to enforce a follow-on in a three-day match is 150 runs. Team A leads exactly by 150 runs after the completion of the first innings of Team B, so they are allowed to enforce the follow-on. You shall accept the captain of Team A's request to enforce the follow-on, and Team B must bat again. Question four is deals with overthrows. The striker hits the ball to mid-wicket and the batters set off for a quick single. The mid-wicket fielder picks up the ball and tries to run out the striker at the bowler's end. At the instant of the throw, the batters have crossed for the first run. The ball misses the stumps and goes on to trickle over the cover boundary as the batters complete their fourth run. Discuss and explain the procedure to follow. The law says that if the boundary results from an overthrow or the willful act of a fielder, the run scored shall be any runs for penalties awarded to either side, the allowance for the boundary, 
and the runs completed by the batters together with the run in progress if they had crossed at the instant of the throw. And this is the important point is at the instant of the throw, not when the ball crosses the boundary, but at the instant of the throw, how many runs had they crossed for? So we need to signal boundary four to the scorers and wait for the acknowledgement. One run accrues for the batters because they had crossed for the first run at the instant of the throw. So a total of five runs will be added to the striker's score and also the batting team's score. Um, but we're not signaling penalty runs, obviously. What we are signaling is after the boundary four signal, we signal five to the scorers by holding up an open palm facing your chest. Okay, um, not too high and not too low. Probably uh, chest height is the perfect height and the back of your hand should be facing the scorers because if your palm is facing the scorers, then they could confuse that for a signal of buys. If still in the same over, the non-striker of the previous ball will face the next delivery. Okay. Uh, obviously, if you have an uneven amount of runs scored, then the non-striker will face the next delivery. Then we've got the fifth question. On the fifth ball of the 50th over, team B requires five runs to win. The striker who is on 85 runs is currently batting with the number 10. The striker hits the ball towards the cover boundary and starts to run. The batters complete one run, but you, as the bowler's end umpire, notice that the striker purposefully ran short at the bowler's end when turning for the second run. Explain your actions and the procedure to follow. I need to correct myself from Monday. Um, I said that the law book, when there is a deliberate attempt at short runs, the law book does not ask us to signal short run, but in fact it does. Uh, thanks, Abdullah, for picking that up for me. Um, so we need to call and signal short run as soon as the ball becomes dead and inform the other umpire. We need to disallow all runs to the batting side. And the best way to do that is to um, signal dead ball. And the scorers will also know that uh, all runs are being disallowed when we return any not out batters to their original ends. If there was a no ball or a wide, signal those to the scorers as applicable. And then we award five penalty runs to the fielding side. And try and inform the scorers as to the number of runs to be recorded. They usually are pretty clued up. As I mentioned, if you send the batters back to the original ends, scorers will know that all runs have been disallowed. Uh, but just make sure at the next interval when you go off the field that the scorers um, recorded the correct amount of runs, which in this case should have been null for this delivery. Inform and report. This is not given as a mark in the exam, but um, good for you to always know the procedure in full. So those are the revision questions from Monday. I hope that clears up any confusion from the checking of the calculation of uh, last hour um, minimum overs remaining. 
as well as the procedure for deliberate short runs. Law 20 is dead ball. And again, a reminder that we are not going through all the laws in level three. We are only going through the laws that are examined in the Cricket South Africa level three exam. And we're only touching on particular parts of those laws. So you will see, especially with the no ball law that Abdullah is going to go through, that we are going through a limited amount of slides compared to the level one presentation. As we should all know by now, the law tells us of instances where the ball becomes automatically dead. And then it tells us of incidences where us as umpires need to call and signal dead ball. So we're going to go through them again because dead ball comes up in every exam and will always be part of your lives as cricket umpires. The ball becomes dead when it is finally settled in the hands of the wicketkeeper or of the bowler. And of course, the ball becomes dead when a boundary is scored. When a batsman is dismissed, the ball becomes dead. Nothing more can happen. It's not like baseball where you can have a double play and get two batters out in the same ball. Uh, in cricket, once one batter is dismissed, then the ball becomes dead. Whether played or not, the ball becomes trapped between the bat and person of a batter or between items of his or her clothing or equipment. The ball will become dead. Quite often, especially in junior cricket, if there is a short leg fielder, the batter plays a forward defensive. The ball goes off the face of the bat and goes down and gets stuck between the flap of the pad as well as the thigh of the batter or the knee of the batter. Um, then the short leg fielder will try and run up to the batter and grab the ball and claim a catch. Uh, that is not possible because the ball becomes automatically dead when it is trapped between the bat and the person of a batter or between items of his or her clothing or equipment. The ball also becomes dead whether played or not. It lodges in the clothing or equipment of a batter or the clothing of an umpire. Okay, quite important, the ball does not become dead if it lodges in the clothing or equipment of a fielder. Okay, as we I'm sure know, uh, a batter can actually be caught if a ball is struck firmly into the helmet of a short leg fielder or any fielder uh, for that case and the ball lodges in the grill of the fielder as long as that helmet is worn by the fielder um, the ball does not become dead um, it can be caught and of course obviously once the batter is dismissed then the ball will become dead the ball becomes dead if there's an award of penalty runs when a player returns without permission and comes into contact with the ball or a fielder fields the ball illegally and in those two instances the ball shall not count as one of the over the ball also becomes dead if there is a contravention of law 28.3 protective helmets belonging to the fielding side if the ball goes through the wicketkeeper's legs and the helmet that was worn by the short leg fielder has been discarded behind the wicketkeeper and the ball hits that 
helmet placed behind the wiki keeper, we know that that the ball becomes automatically dead and five penalty runs are awarded to the batting side. Um, even though the ball becomes automatically dead, it is good umpiring practice to call and signal dead ball because not all of the players would have seen the ball hitting the helmet. And teamwork is quite important in this particular incident because the bowlers and umpire might not see the ball hitting the helmet because the wicketkeeper is likely to be uh, obstructing the bowlers and umpire's view of the ball hitting the helmet. So the strikers and umpire uh, should call and signal dead ball if the ball hits the helmet placed behind the wicketkeeper. Of course, the ball is dead once the match is concluded. Very important, neither the call of over nor the call of time is to be made until the ball is dead. Okay, so do not be in a hurry to call over. Um, wait until nothing is happening and both teams have considered the ball to be dead before you call over. As just mentioned, the ball shall be considered to be dead when it is clear to the bowlers and umpire that the fielding side and both batters at the wicket have ceased to regard the ball as in play. So, let's put that theory into test with this particular incident that has been floating around social media the last couple of days. And you need to decide whether you're going to give this appeal out or you're going to uh, consider the ball having been dead. I'm going to play the video twice and all of you need to, in the chat box, please enter out or dead ball once you've seen the video. I'm going to play the video again for you. Uh, obviously, the on field umpire there has given the batter out, and the batter is walking off. Um, would you have done the same or would you have considered the ball to be dead? Uh, read the law below. Whether the ball is finally settled or not is a matter for the umpire alone to decide. So this is your decision to make. Dead ball or out? <laughs> Okay, we'll go through that scenario just before we get to this evening's revision questions with Abdullah. So previously we have just looked at the incidents when the ball becomes automatically dead. Now we're going to go through when an umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. The law requires either umpire to call and signal dead ball when they intervene in a case of unfair play. Either umpire shall call and signal dead ball when a serious injury to a player or umpire occurs. Either umpire shall call and signal dead ball when he or she leaves their normal position for consultation with their partner. Either umpire shall call and signal dead ball when one or both bells fall from the striker's wicket before the striker has had the opportunity of playing the ball. 
Either umpire shall call and signal dead ball when the striker is not ready for the delivery of the ball and, if the ball is delivered, makes no attempt to play it. Provided the umpire is satisfied that the striker had adequate reason for not being ready, the ball shall not count as one of the over. We also need to call and signal dead ball if the striker is distracted by any noise or movement. Or in any other way while preparing to receive or receiving a delivery. Once again, this ball shall not count as one of the over. If there is a deliberate attempt to distract, deceive or obstruct the batter, the ball shall not count as one of the over and we shall call and signal dead ball. If the bowler drops the ball accidentally before delivery, the bowlers and umpire shall call and signal dead ball. If the ball does not leave the bowler's hand other than in an attempt to run out the non-striker, the bowlers and umpire shall call and signal dead ball. When an umpire is satisfied that the ball in play cannot be recovered, this is an alteration to the previous law of lost ball. Uh, either umpire shall call and signal dead ball. When does the ball cease to be dead? The law tells us that the ball comes into play when the bowler starts his or her run-up, or if no run-up, starts his or her bowling action. That is my law for this evening. Thank you very much for your participation in the chat box. We shall discuss that dead ball or out uh, later once Abdullah is done with his presenting. Over to you, Abdullah. Uh, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. I'm kicking off uh, my portion of this evening lecture with uh, no ball. And the sub section that I will cover under no ball, I'm going to start off with what happens if the bowler, while in his run up and going to deliver the ball, breaks the wicket. So the law tells us that either umpire can call or should call. Signal, uh, should, uh, call and signal no ball if while that bowler is in his run up on his way to deliver the ball and the bowler breaks the wicket at any time after the ball comes into play and before the bowler completes the stride of after the delivery stride. So if you can visualize the moment the bowler takes his or her first step, that is when the ball becomes alive. So now the bowler is running in to deliver the ball. The law tells us if the bowler breaks the wicket in any way, so with any part of the bowler's body, whether it's hand, the knee, the, the foot, the, the thigh, any part of the body. And if uh, the bowler breaks the wicket, either umpire to call and signal no ball. So the window period for this is the moment the bowler uh, comes into his delivery, um, the moment the, um, the bowler takes his first step, that is when it starts and it ends all, um, after the bowler completes the stride after the delivery stride. The bowler breaking or trying to, to attempt to run out the non-striker, that is something uh, different, which we currently handle under law 41, but this is the bowler running in and breaks the wicket with any part of his or her body. Also, if the bowler, and sometimes you do find bowlers wearing a, a, a towel to maybe dry their hands or dry the ball, the law tells us that 
if any clothing or other object that falls from the bowler and this clothing or object breaks the wicket, either umpire also to call and signal no ball. Next section that I'm handling under the noble is what do you do if a ball bouncing more than once or it rolls along the ground? So either umpire to call and signal no ball if a ball that was delivered without previously being touched by the bat or the person of the striker, this ball now bounces more than once or it starts rolling along the ground before reaching the popping crease. So the law tells us if the ball has been delivered and the ball either bounces more than once or starting to roll al along the ground before reaching the popping crease. So the important part here is it, it, it needs to bounce more than once before the popping crease or it starts rolling along the ground before the popping crease. If that is the case, either umpire to call and signal no ball. So if you can visualize the bowler delivering the ball, the bowler, after delivering the ball, it pitches once and then it pitches a second time before the popping crease. So if you can visualize it, the ball pitching once and then a second time before the popping crease or the ball gets delivered and it starts rolling before reaching the popping crease. If that is the case, either umpire to call and signal no ball. So the important thing here is it either needs to bounce a second time before reaching the popping crease or rolling along the ground before reaching the popping crease. If it bounces, uh, the bowler delivers the ball and it bounces once and the second bounce is after the popping crease, that is a legal delivery. The crucial part here is it needs to bounce more than once or a second time before reaching the popping crease for either umpire to call and signal no ball. Also, either umpire to call and signal no ball if the ball has been delivered and the ball now either pitches totally or wholly off the pitch or even partially off the pitch before it reaches the line of the striker's wicket. So that's also crucial here. The ball being the, or that was delivered needs to either bounce wholly off the pitch or partially off the pitch before reaching the striker's wicket. If that is the case, either umpire to call and signal no ball. But obviously, it says either umpire, but the best umpire, the bowlers in umpire is in the best position to make the score. There are times actually where the strikers in umpire can assist you and the strikers in umpire can assist you or in the call whether the ball pitched before the striker's wicket or after the striker's wicket. So if it pitches off the pitch before the striker's wicket, you, the, um, you can call and signal or you should call and signal no ball. No ball shall not count as one, one of the balls of the over. And the last section under no ball, how can you be dismissed of a no ball? There are three ways to be dismissed of a no ball. Hit the ball twice. Obstructing the field. And lastly, run out. That is all under no ball. Under wide ball, there's only two sections that we're covering. A wide ball shall not count as one of 
the valid balls of the over. And lastly, under wide under the wide law, how can you be dismissed from a wide? Four ways. Firstly, hit wicket, obstructing the field, run out, and the fourth way of being dismissed off a wide is stumped. So there are three ways to be dismissed of a no ball and four ways to be dismissed from a wide. The last law that I will be covering uh, this evening is leg buys. And after this law, um, I will go through the revision questions. And after the revision questions, we will open the, the floor for Q&A. And we're going to uh, follow the same format with our revision questions. So we're going to uh, have it interactive. So I will pose the questions and we will go to the floor and you guys will have to um, interact in answering the revision questions. So leg bias. So what are leg bias? So leg bias is a ball that was delivered and the ball strikes the person or the protective equipment of the striker. So ball delivered and that ball strikes any part of the person or the protective equipment of the striker. And if that is the case, leg by shall be scored, but there are two criteria that needs to be met. So the first thing, the, um, the ball needs to strike the person, any part of the person, or the protective equipment. And for leg bias to be awarded, two criteria needs to be met. What are those criteria for leg buys to be awarded? The first criteria is the striker needs to attempt to play the ball with the bat. That's the first criteria for leg buys to be scored. Striker needs to attempt to play the ball with the bat. Second criteria, the striker try to avoid being hit by the ball. So leg buys, just to summarize again, the ball delivered and it, the ball strikes any part of the person or the protective equipment of the striker. And then if they do decide to run, leg buys can only be scored if two criteria are met. First criteria is the striker needs to attempt to play the ball with a bat. Second criteria, the striker needs to try to avoid being hit by the ball. If these one of these criteria are met, the uh, leg buys can be awarded or should be awarded if they do decide to run. If the delivery is a no ball, the one run penalty for the no ball shall also be scored. So leg buys will count, and if the ball was a no ball, the no ball shall also be scored. So now we've, we've just covered when leg buys shall be awarded and the criteria that needs to be in place for those leg buys to be awarded. But what does the law say? When will leg buys not be awarded? Uh, yes, so we've, we saw the criteria when, it, uh, when leg buys can be awarded. So this is just the, the opposite. Uh, the criteria for leg buys not to be awarded is if the umpire considers that the striker did not attempt to play the ball with the bat, nor did the striker try to avoid being hit by the ball. If this is the case, then leg buys shall not be awarded. So the criteria here is for leg buys not to be awarded 
the umpire needs to consider that the striker did not make a genuine attempt to play the ball with the bat, or the striker did not try to avoid being hit by the ball. If this is the case, the stri- then leg pies shall not be awarded. Then, so you'll often you'll often find that the uh, the striker not a, did not attempt to play the ball uh, with uh, with the bat and then decides to take a run so technically as per the laws of cricket leg by should not be awarded even if they do decide to run uh, but the law gives the fielding side the opportunity to run out either of the batters if they do decide to run. So, yes, technically the law says no runs will be awarded, but the law gives a small window period for that allows the fielding side to run out either of uh, the batters. And what is that window period? That period is the ball will only become dead as soon as the ball reaches the boundary or the completion of the first run. So the window period that the fielding side has to run out the non, uh, the, uh, either of the batters if the striker did not attempt to play the ball with his bat or try to avoid being hit by the ball. So if they do decide to run, there is an opportunity to run out either of the batters. And that window period closes if the ball reaches the boundary or at the completion of the first run. Once the first run is completed or the ball reaches the boundary, the umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. So if you can visualize a scenario, the the, um, striker shoulders, arms, and the ball hits the pad and the ball ricochets into the the covers. So firstly, did the uh, the bear striker attempt to play the ball with the, uh, with the bat? So in our case, he shouldered arms, so there was no attempt to play the ball with the bat. So, so leg bias shall not be awarded in this case. But the the batters do then decide to run. So the law allows or the, uh, the fielding side to run out either of the batters. So now they, the, they do decide to run. As soon as the, the batters complete the first run, the umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. The bowlers in umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. Or if the ball didn't play a shot and it ricochets and it goes towards the bo- off the pad, it ricochets off the pad and it goes towards the boundary. As soon as the ball goes over the boundary, the ball, um, the bowler's in umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. So that window period to run out the either of the batters stops when either the ball reaches the boundary or on the completion of the first run. So any time before the completion of the first run, either of the batters can still be run out. As long as that first run is not completed, as long as uh, the striker does not reach the, uh, the uh, put his um, usual bat behind the popping crease that the bowl is in, or the non-striker gets to the striker's end. As long as that first run has not been completed, the fielding side has the opportunity to run out either of the batters. So now, let's say they, the, the batters completed the first run. What shall the umpire then do? We've just heard now that a leg by shall not be awarded, but they, the batters, the striker soldered arms and the batters took a run and the striker then made his, his, um, his ground at the, now at the bowler's end. The law now tells us, the bowler's in umpire, to call and signal dead ball. 
And then what do you do? You shall disallow all runs to the batting side. Secondly, remember there was a window period to run out either of the batters. If they completed, the batters completed the single and there was no run out, you then will return the batters to the original end. If there was a run out, the not out batter will go to his or her original end. If there was a no ball, you, um, bowlers in umpire needs to signal this to the scorers. Also, you shall award any five penalty runs that was applicable from this delivery, except there's one particular penalty runs that will not be awarded. And that is if the ball should hit the protective helmet belonging to the fielding side that was placed behind the bowler. So, bullet point number four, you will award any five penalty runs from uh, that can be, uh, that could have happened from this particular delivery. Uh, example is, let's say the, the batter's was already on a warning for uh, um, running st straight down the middle of, of the pitch. And now from this delivery, bat striker shouldered arms, again running straight down the middle. So if you do it a second time after receiving your first and final warning, penalty runs will, will um, be incurred. So the law tells us that you, you that's an example of you will award those type of penalty runs or any other penalty runs except one. If the ball should hit the protective helmet belonging to the fielding side that was placed um, um, there by the fielding side. So in a scenario where let's say the, the ball gets delivered, striker sold his arms, the ball goes against the pad. It ricochets from the pad to the third man boundary. The batter decides to take a run. The ball gets returned by the third by the fielder that's on the third man boundary. And upon returning the ball to the to the wicket keeper, the ball then makes contact with the helmet that was placed behind the behind the keeper. So if you can visualize best striker not offering a shot, ball goes to third man. Third man throws the ball to the keeper. The batter takes takes a run. The 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 ball that was returned from third man <clears throat> then strikes or goes against the the helmet that was placed behind um, the keeper. The law tells us that that penalty runs, usually if the ball goes against the helmet placed behind the keeper, the ball will immediately become dead and five penalty runs will go to the batting side. That is what usually happens if the ball strikes the, the, the helmet um, placed by the fielding side behind the keeper. But here the law is quite clear. If the striker not offering a shot and they decide to run and the ball while in play for that delivery goes against the, the uh, helmet that was placed behind the keeper. Those penalty runs shall not be awarded. So Tom, that is all I am covering uh, for this, uh, or laws I'm covering for this evening. I am now going to go through the revision questions. Um, if you, I'll start with the first one, and you can let me know if there are any hands. So when you, when you get these type of uh, uh, um, questions, the best way to answer them is to visualize what is happening. So you read, you close your eyes. And you try to visualize 
what is happening on the field of play. And uh, you can read it the first time, you can read the full question and then cut it up into smaller pieces. So read the question, cut it, cut it into then smaller pieces and try to visualize what is happening on the field of play. And that will help you answer these type of questions. So if you can restart reading the question, the bowler delivers a ball, pitching outside. Abdullah, it looks like you've just muted yourself. If you can unmute uh, so, and carry on. Thanks, Tom. Yes, my so my elbow wins against the mute button. Sorry. Thank you, Tom. So um, I'm not sure we I'm not sure we you we uh, you guys lost me. Uh, but just to recap, so when re when reading these type of questions, you read it in full the first time, and when you read it the second time, try to visualize what is happening, and then cut it into smaller pieces. So cut into smaller pieces and visualize. So bowler bowling a, de a delivery, pitching outside off stump. The batter sold his arms. So now ready, sell those arms. Ready, bells needs to ring in your head. After soldering arms, the ball now then comes back and hit the front pad above the knee roll. There's this huge LB appeal. Umpire shakes uh, his head and says not out. So he turns down the appeal. So after um, striking the front pad, the ball then eludes the keeper and it then eats the helmet that was placed behind the keeper. Discuss and explain the procedure to follow. So Tom, let's give them a few seconds just to visualize uh, this and if we can get a few hands, uh, any hands, yeah, four marks for this question. Abdullah, it's uh, obviously a, a very involved scenario, yeah. uh, but we do eventually have hands. First one up was Jamie Davids. Please unmute your microphone and take us through the scenario. Evening, gentlemen. Uh, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, so in this scenario, I am thinking that since it has hit, okay, firstly, is the batsman taking a run? And I'm thinking they aren't. Um, just asking that question first. So, if they aren't taking a run and the ball has hit the helmet, then what I would do is signal dead ball, and pretty much that's it, because clearly the batsman hasn't done anything, and there was a RBW appeal, and it's been turned down. So... That's what I think, anyway, would be done. So Thanks, Jamie. Uh, there are full marks here, so I'm going to yeah. ask Ar Arun to uh, maybe okay. give us a little bit more as to what the law tells us to do. Even if you're not doing anything, you must still um, okay. refer to what the law says for um, leg buys or being awarded or not being awarded. Arun, please oh. unmute your microphone and go ahead. Yeah, in this case, uh, it has hit the pad, of course. But uh, the statement doesn't have any uh, mention that the batters are going for a run. So the ball has definitely hit the helmet. But as an umpire, I would just declare it as a dead ball and not even award the penalty runs. Had the batters been attempting a run and the fielders would have neglected it and it would have hit the uh, helmet, it would have also been awarded a dead ball, but with five penalty runs. I see more hands are up. Uh, Herve, do you want to add one or two more things to this answer? Unmute your microphone, Herve. The floor is yours.
Hervé, I see your microphone is unmuted, but we cannot hear anything. So I'm going to give Nazmi a chance to add uh, his opinion on the scenario. Nazmi, uh, do you want to take us through this scenario? Thank you. Hi, good evening all. I would um, look at, um, first we look at the LBW. Did a batsman attempt to play the ball? Okay, and um, if he attempted to play the ball and it's above the, um, what they call the needle, look at the LBW first. And if the ball went against the helmet um, without attempting to play the ball, uh, we wouldn't allow five runs. We would call it dead ball. Um, and I think, yeah, that's basically it. Um, OK, um, let us just assume, because you need to add this to your answer as well. Let us assume that the batters had attempted a run. Um, Varun, can you unmute your microphone and tell us as the umpire what you would do in this case? Am I audible, sir? Yes, loud and clear, Varun. Yeah, sir, uh, after the umpire has uh, Nick, uh, sir, turned down the uh, appeal for LBW, the ball has gone to the wicket keeper keeper uh, and then hits the fielding helmet placed behind him so in case ball automatically becomes dead and five penalty runs are awarded to the uh, 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 to the uh, uh, to the bowling side uh, irrespective uh, to the batting side irrespective uh, you know uh, of the run being taken or not okay varun not quite uh, what i was looking for uh, firstly, no penalty runs are awarded because the ball has come off the bat. Uh, one of the, sorry, the ball has come off the pad without any attempt to play a shot. So um, leg buys are being uh, disallowed in this particular case. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give uh, Cindy a chance to hopefully. I want give to add on this. So may I? So I want to add on this. So I thought okay, well, uh, it was. So may I? Yeah, carry on, Varun. Yes, I thought sir, it was. Uh, you know, he attempted to play. Yes, uh, runs won't be. Uh, you know, a five penalty run won't be allowed. But uh, if they are attempting the run on uh, after they have crossed for first run, uh, the umpire shall call in signal dead ball. OK, thanks, Varun. Um, Cindy, you can you've unmuted my, your microphone. Please give us the last two marks that I'm looking for for this particular answer. Cindy, I think your signal is um, still very poor. I saw you wrote on the yeah. chat box earlier. We can't really hear you. Hear me now? Um, yeah, OK, go for it. I'll, I'll try. Um, so I presume as the umpire is turning down the appeal, he has considered that the ball legal delivery to Um. So uh, we got to the part where there was, they attempted a run, there was no attempt to play the ball, and no penalty runs were awarded. Because all of that. So to finish it off, I would say, um, Signal allow them to complete the run if the ball hasn't boundary. Signal dead ball. Uh, it will disallow any runs that have taken place. Mm -hmm. And return the batsman to the original end if no run out. There we go. That's exactly what I was looking for, Cindy. Return the batters to the original end. Uh, Abdullah, you want to put up the full memo for us. There's a lot to get through here. Yeah? Well done, guys. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for all your input. Yeah, well done, everyone. Yeah, so just to summarize what the memo is saying. So if the ball the, that was delivered and he strikes the person of the striker, runs shall only be scored if the umpire 
is satisfied that either the striker attempted to play the ball with the bat or the striker tried to avoid being hit by the ball. So if the umpire consider that these two criteria were not met, then leg by shall not be awarded. So if the ball does not become dead for any other reason, the umpire shall call and signal dead ball as soon as the ball reaches the boundary or at the completion of the first run. If they did decide to run, the umpire shall then disallow all runs to the batting side. The umpire shall return any not out batter to, to his or her original end. If there was a no ball, the umpire needs to signal to the scorers. Award any five penalty runs, except if the ball should hit the protective helmet belonging to the fielding side. So in this scenario, because the striker does not play a shot, in, in the question you'll see it says the batter soldered arms. So that is, striker did not attempt to play at the ball. And if the ball then hits the striker's pads, leg bias can then not be scored. As soon as the ball hits the protective element of the fielding side, uh, we've learned, um, uh, uh, Tom covered this earlier, under the dead ball law, the ball then automatically becomes dead. In this instance, usually we will award five penalty runs if the ball hits the fielding helmet, but in this instance, we shall not award the five penalty runs to the batting side. And the reason for this is the law tells us, if you look at the fourth uh, bullet point, because the striker did not attempt to play at the ball, and if that is the case, and if the ball then strikes the protective helmet belonging to the fielding side behind the keeper, we shall not award the five penalty runs. Any other instances, we shall award the five penalty runs. In this case, we shall not award the five penalty runs if the ball hits the helmet behind the keeper and the striker did not offer a shot. So, well done to those that answered. Second of the revision questions. So, again, uh, you read the question in full. After reading it, you then break it up into smaller pieces and then visualize what they are trying to tell you. It makes answering the question, um, question easier. So as you are standing up to the stumps, the bowler decides to deceive the batter by delivering the ball from 1.5 meters behind the bowling crease. As you, as the umpire, are focusing on the popping crease, you notice through your peripheral vision that the ball passing you, is passing you on its way towards the batter. So if you can visualize this, you standing close to the stumps, your eyes on the front line, the bowler then decides to bowl from a meter and a half behind the umpire. You just see the ball coming past your head on towards the, the, the striker. Explain your actions in full, uh, if any. Yeah, Tom, let's give them a few seconds to digest this and then um, can let me know if we have any hands. Uh, no hands at the moment, Abdullah. I know it's another intricate scenario and probably <laughs> something that they've never seen before. Um, but Bavesh, Bavin has got his hand up now. Bavin, please unmute your microphone. Take us through the scenario and what you would do, if anything. Uh, according to me as an empire, if I find the bowler has bowled behind me or the ball has passed after the bowling stride has been done by the bowler, which is not been visualized by the empire, 
it is automatically called a dead ball. That's a good start, Pavlin. Um, anything that you would say to the bowler um, after calling and signaling dead ball? Uh, yes, you have to warn the bowler and uh, the captain of the fielding side that this is uh, not the right way of the delivery and make sure the ball uh, bowler balls into his right bowling stride from the bowling uh, crease. Great stuff, Pavin. Thank you for that. Um, Shashi Kant, uh, your hand is up. Uh, please unmute your microphone and tell us, does this ball count as one legal delivery in the over or not? Uh, according to me, what I would say that uh, it is a legal delivery, but uh, uh, you, you consult the bowler for the next ball that uh, uh, if he's a fast bowler, then you move a bit behind. But I think uh, you can ball be, uh, before the popping crease. It is a valid ball. Okay, uh, interesting, Shashikan. You've touched on some very good points. Uh, let's hear from Hans if uh, he agrees or differs. Please unmute your microphone, Hans, and uh, take us through the scenario. Good evening, Tom Abdullah. Um, now, I disagree um, because you've uh, already called and signaled dead ball. Uh, the ball will not count as one of the over and needs to be rebowled. That's correct, Hans. I'm happy with that. Uh, Olumide, you've got your hand up. Anything you'd like to add to this scenario? Please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Tom, for the opportunity. I was going to say that I would take my hint from the question that says the bowler decides to deceive the batsman. So for me, that is a deliberate act, deliberate attempt to deceive or distract the batsman. And it's against what the law says. If a player attempts to deliberately deceive or distract the batsman, you call and signal dead ball immediately. Neither batsman will be out from that delivery. And then you award five penalty runs. To the bat side. That's my interesting, interpretation. Interesting interpretation, Olumide. Um, and I'm sure Abdullah will take us through the memorandum now to Tell us who of you gentlemen were right. Um, a lot of good points and correct points from, from all of you. Uh, yes, Tom, thank you. Yeah, a lot of uh, good uh, points that was raised uh, by everyone. So in this case, as soon as you see the ball passing be behind you, you call and signal dead ball. The ball will not count as a legal delivery in the over and needs to be rebuilt. If any runs were attempted or scored from that delivery, they need to be disallowed. If the batters decided to run, please return them to the original ends. Have a word with the bowler and warn him that if any further deliveries are bowled from behind the umpire, this will be then considered as time wasting. And then what, you, what you'll do is consider standing a bit further from the stumps to prevent the bowler from bowling behind you. If you look at the question, they say the, the umpire standing fairly close uh, to the stump. So you can consider just going a bit back and maybe this will prevent the bowler from bowling behind you again. The next question, Tom. The striker does not attempt to play at the ball. The ball strikes the striker on the pad. And it ricochets to the short fine leg position. 
the non-striker calls the calls for a quick single before the non-striker can make his or her ground at the striker's in the wicket keeper has broken the stumps with the ball there's a huge appeal by the fielding side discuss and explain again cut it in smaller pieces and try to visualize what's <clears throat> happening Tom, let's give them, uh, let's give the attendees a few se uh, seconds to visualize. And then the visualization the is, yeah, the visualization is very good on this one, Abdullah. Uh, we've got five hands up. Uh, one of them is a new hand. And Juguna, welcome back. Long time no see. Please unmute your microphone and talk us through Thank this you. scenario. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, hello to everybody. Um, as I read the statement, the striker does not attempt to play the ball. So automatically, uh, if it hits the pad, no runs can be scored of it. Um, and then while he attempts to run, I'll give the fielding side an opportunity to uh, run the, either of the batsmen out. On that's only on the first uh, instance, meaning on the first run. Now, since this, this uh, the wickets are broken before the batsman are complete their first run. I'll give out the batsman, and then on top of that, I'll signal dead ball and uh, make sure that the uh, scorers uh, have acknowledged so that now that ball does not count for the over. Thank you. Very good, Njuguna. Uh, Abdullah, I think we can go straight to the memorandum answer. It was pretty much well covered by Njuguna. Uh, yeah, uh, just to add something, Njuguna, um, uh, um, if I heard you correctly, I think you said you'll signal dead ball and this ball not to count for the over. Is that what you said, Tom? Yes. Oh, yeah, yes, 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 yeah. I've, I've so why, why, would you, yes. why would this ball not count no, for the over? No, no, I've just realized, I've just realized uh, it will it will count for the over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank Thanks. you, thank you, uh, thank you Abdullah. <laughs> no, well, well done, excellent answer. So, so yes, as Nzikuna alluded to, the no shot uh, uh, was offered, so leg by shall not uh, be awarded. And the umpire shall call and signal dead ball as soon as the ball reaches the boundary or at the completion of the first run. And, and, and Zakuna alluded to the fact that the, uh, in the question, the, the two batters did not complete the first run yet. So the full fielding team had, still has the opportunity to dismiss either of the batters, which they did in this case. Because of that, the, complete run, the first run wasn't completed. So that's why the non-striker should be given out, run out, because the ball only becomes dead upon the completion of the first run. Because no stri no um, uh, the striker didn't attempt to play with the, uh, the um, did not attempt to play at the ball, no run shall be allowed from this particular particular uh, delivery. So the the non-striker was run out at the at the keeper's in. So you need to to send everyone back to the original ends. So the striker needs to go back to his or her original in, and the incoming batter needs to go to if there are still further balls to be bowled, needs to go to the bowler's in. The bowler delivers a short pitch, slower ball. The ball bouncing halfway down the pitch. The striker seeing this moves deep into the crease. The ball now bounces a second time behind the popping crease. 
And then the striker hits the ball in the air towards the mid off fielder. The fielder, the middle fielder then catches the ball, but then realizes the non-striker, who is the better of the two batters, has backed up a long way down the pitch. The middle fielder then throws down the wicket at the bowler's end with the non-striker sort of his or her ground. There's a huge appeal by the fielding side. Discuss and explain the procedure to follow. Again, it's a mouthful. Break it up into smaller pieces and visualize what the question is trying to tell us. Tom, let's give Jamie. him a few seconds. Oh, unless there are their hands already, Tom. Uh, Jamie has a very quick visualization. Mm, uh, sure, impressive, Jamie. Yeah, now because I, I think I've seen a situation you. like this. Um, so with this, if it's uh, the ball, as I assume, it's bounced twice. That means that this ball is a no ball. And since the batsman has hit it, which they are allowed to do, um, and the field there has caught it, well, the ball, they wouldn't be out caught, the striker anyway. But the non-striker will be out run out um, as, far as, I, as far as I'm concerned. So you'll signal no ball, but the non-strike will be out run out in this situation. Um, I'm going to um, give I'm going to give Hans an opportunity uh, to disagree or agree with Jamie's answer. Hans, please unmute your microphone and take us through the scenario. Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, look, um, the law says that the ball needs to bounce twice before it reaches the popping trees. Um, and in this instance, it has not. Um, it, it bounced behind the popping trees the second time. So when the batsman needs the ball in the air and, he's, and he gets caught, he will be given out caught. Um, although uh, the fielder throws down the wicket um, at the non-striker's end, uh, the, first, the, the first one shall count. So the batsman will be out caught. Perfect, Hans. Um, just to complete the answer, um, remember that court takes precedence over any other mode of uh, dismissal except for bold. Um, so that would be the third uh, point on the memorandum, if I'm not mistaken. Dula? Uh, yes, Tom, uh, that is the last point uh, in the memorandum. And as Hans correctly alluded to, uh, because the ball only bounced a second time after the popping crease, it is then constituted to being a fair delivery. If the ball bounced a second time before reaching the popping crease, then it would have been a no ball. But because it's after the popping crease, Fair delivery. The striker, uh, the, the striker, they need the ball to Mudoff, who catches it. The striker should be given out court. Non-striker uh, shall not be given out the run out. And be, the reason is, the court takes precedence over any other dismissals except uh, bold. Uh, well done. The bowler, while delivering the ball, accidentally breaks the wicket with his knee. The ball, the delivery then, hits the striker's wicket. What happens next? Very quick hand up from Rensia. Please unmute your microphone and talk us through the scenario. What would you do? Uh, evening, everyone. Um, only reason for this because this has actually happened to me recently. Um, you, as the strikers and I mean, at the non strikers and umpire, shall immediately before the, the boys delivered, um, if possible, call and signal no ball. Um, and if ball has been played, um, allow ball to play in in the case of being having having a potential run out 
for the batters and yeah that um but it would not count one ball for the over so you would take no ball but would not count okay uh Rencher, just a point of correction Thanks. um we need to wait until the ball is bowled before calling no ball because if the ball is not bowled then we would call dead ball okay so a ball can only be called no ball if it is bold i think it's been bold yeah yes yes sorry i, I mixed my my words there yes sorry pressure <laughs> and and of course um the ball went on to hit the striker's wicket so yeah. is the striker out bold or not not out not out why because it is a it's, it's a noble noble correct there yeah. we go that's that's your answer Renchi. thank you you're welcome yeah well done uh, Renche. tom that is the revision questions for this evening we can um now open the floor for q a thanks very much uh Dula. um and guys i think quite important with those scenario questions like Abdullah mentioned is you need to visualize it in your head before you start writing and give as much information as you can. You saw that for a four mark uh, question, they gave eight points and only half a mark was given for each point. So don't be shy to write too much information. Uh, obviously, it needs to be correct information for you to get marks. Um, but similar to level two, um, we won't rush you in terms of having to finish within the given time period. The level three exam is 120 marks and it's 180 uh, minutes. Um, and we do find that some people need more than the three hours. That's fine. We'll give you more than three hours. We won't give you more than four hours. Uh, but within reason, we will give you time to think through the scenarios and make sure that you put down the law and then you put down the application of the law for that scenario. OK, that's as you've seen is what the memorandum expects of you is to write down the applicable law to the scenario and then write down your application of that law for the scenario. Cool, so now we're going to go to the questions in the chat box and I started the evening with a video scenario of a bowler uh, fielding a ball um, along the wickets, along the pitch, and then uh, as he was walking back towards his mark, he decided and saw that the non-striker was out of his crease and decided to run the non-striker out. So the question there is, is that better out or um, should you as the bowlers and umpire call and signal dead ball because you had considered the ball to be dead? Um, so the law says that whether the ball is set, finally settled is up to the umpire to decide. Um, and in my mind, if I look at that video, I'm not going to play it again. We saw it twice. Uh, the bowler has got the ball in his hand and that is pretty much well settled in his hand and he is walking back towards his mark. Uh, only then does he see that the non-striker is out of his crease uh, but at that point, as he's walking back towards his mark the, with the ball settled in his hand, um, I would consider that ball dead and would, upon the appeal, uh, call and signal dead ball and just tell the bowler and the fielding captain that I had considered the ball to be dead because the bowler was walking back towards his mark with the ball in hand. Abdullah, I don't know if you saw that incident um, differently or if you had given 
you would have given the better out. Uh, I know a few, I see a few of those um, answers were out. Uh, the gunslingers amongst us. Um, what's your opinion there? Exactly the same as yours, Tom. Uh, dead ball. And and I, I would um, you can put it under two uh, two places. Um, uh, you can either put it under ball finally settled in the hand of the bowler. The law tells us uh, it, in, it's up to the umpire to decide when the ball is finally settled in the hand of uh, the wicket keeper or the bowler. So you can you can um, argue the case. The ball is finally settled in the hand of the bowler. In dead ball, you can also argue uh, the case of uh, of both uh, sides, uh, batters and and fielding side, have ceased to regard the ball as in play. Because if you look at the if you look at the bowler, he, uh, bowler um, re, um, fielded the ball um, of his own bowling. The bowler then takes a few steps about three or four steps and he's and the bowler's now on his way to bowl the next delivery and then after taking uh, a few steps then he saw the non-striker out, out of his crease and then he has a, a side the stumps but for that two three uh, steps that the bowler took uh, the bowler deemed the ball to be dead so i.e the ball is dead so you, you cannot have, the ball cannot be dead and then suddenly you make the ball undead again once the ball is dead, it's dead. So for me, Tom, there's an argument under both. Finally settled and batters and field, um, fielding side has ceased to regard the ball as in play. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Um, we posted this video in our Cricket South Africa umpires WhatsApp group. And uh, Murray Rasmus said, uh, dead ball and give the bowler a warning for playing outside of the spirit of cricket. Um, <laughs> that's obviously not in the law, but uh, that does tell us that how strongly uh, the world's number one rated umpire in 2021 feels about that type of behavior from the bowler. Um, Cindy asks uh, about the ball lodging in the grill of a close fielder's helmet. Um, so, the ball becomes dead if it uh, lodges or becomes trapped between the bat and person of the striker, as well as being lodged in the clothing of the batter or the umpire. Um, however, if the ball lodges in the grill of a close fielder's helmet, the ball is not dead. Um, however, if it has been hit by the striker into the grill of the helmet and lodges there, the ball is still alive and the fielder with the helmet still worn on the fielder's head can pull the ball out of the lodged spot in the grill and claim the catch. Okay, so the ball does not become dead when it lodges in the grill of a fielder's helmet, but of course it becomes dead when the batter is dismissed. Right, moving down the chat box. Rensha asks, what is the difference between uh, lodged and trapped? To be honest, uh, Abdullah, I'm not a English specialist. Um, I don't think there is much difference between those two words. Uh, do you know if the law sort of differentiates between uh, being lodged versus being trapped? Uh, yes, Tom, uh, there is a difference uh, between uh, the two of them. So um, under the dead ball, um, under point four, they speak about uh, ball being lodged in the uh, equipment. And then point five, they speak about trapped. So I explain the difference in a scenario. So when the ball lodges in the equipment of the batter is, if you can visualize uh, the ball, the, the batter playing back 
and the ball get from the bat or from anywhere uh, goes into the flap of the pad. So that is what the, the law is trying to tell us is the ball lodged in the equipment of the batter. So it lodged in the equipment of the uh, of the pad. So if that is the case, once that ball is lodged in the flap of the pad, the ball automatically becomes dead. When, when it's trapped, so it, uh, the law speaks about trapped between the bat and the person. So if you again visualize, so uh, batter playing forward. So as the batter is playing forward, the, the ball gets trapped between the bat and the pad. So if you can visualize, if you can visualize that better playing forward, the ball, the, the ball now gets stuck between the bat and the pad. So let's say the bat is uh, for playing a forward defensive shot and the ball is um, sun high level, but now the ball is stuck between the bat and the pad. So that is what the law is trying to say. When the ball gets trapped between the bat and the person, the ball then automatically becomes uh, uh, dead. Uh, did I, did I, uh, uh, my second explanation, did you understand, Tom, what I'm trying to say about trapped between pet and person? Did I explain uh, cor myself correctly? Correct, Tula. Thank you very much. For okay, so that is, yeah, that is the difference between the two, between lodge and when it uh, lodge, so lodge in the equipment, and the second one is it gets trapped between bat and person, and uh, uh, the example I used was it gets trapped between the bat and the pad. So the moment it gets trapped between the bat and, and the person or the pad, so the ball then automatically becomes dead. Uh, thanks, Tom. Next question is from K7. Uh, in a no ball, can the batter be out by hitting his wickets? Abdullah, you want to take that one? So how many, uh, thanks for your question, K7. So how many ways can you be dismissed of a no, uh, um, of, of a no ball? There are only three ways as per the law. You can be dismissed of a no ball by a run out. You can be dismissed of a no ball obstructing the field. And you can be dismissed of a no ball, hit the ball twice. Those are the only three methods how you can be dismissed of a no ball. So K7, to, ask you, to answer your question, is hit wicket one of those three? No, it's not. So you cannot be out hit wicket as you cannot be uh, um, uh, out hit wicket of a no ball. Thanks, Thanks for clearing that up, Abdullah. Uh, next question also from K7. Um, can a better be out obstructing the field off a wide? Abdullah, you want to take that one as well? Yeah, take, yeah, yeah, yes, uh, Tom. Uh, K7, there are four ways to be dismissed of a wide. Firstly, you can be dismissed run out of a wide. You can be dismissed stumped of a wide. You can be dismissed obstructing the field of a wide. And you can be dismissed uh, hit wicket. Of a wide. So those are the only four ways that you can be dismissed of a wide. Any other way you are you cannot be dismissed of a wide. Uh, Tom, I forgot uh, um, what was Kay Stevens' question? Well, which which mode of delivery did he ask? Obstructing if you can, if you can be so so K7, yes, obstructing the field is one of the ways that you can be dismissed of a wide. Yeah, I'm, I, I, somehow, somehow I don't have access to the, the chat, the chat uh, group, Tom, so I'm relying on you to, to read the questions to me. No problem. Um, K7's got his hand up. I think he maybe wants some clarity, but uh, we're going to finish reading 
uh, the questions in the chat box first before we open the floor up to questions and answers. Uh, Cindy asks, please clarify, not in the case of a leg buy, okay? If a fielding side hits the protective helmet behind the wicketkeeper when throwing the ball in, then five penalty runs are awarded. Are penalty runs not only awarded if this helmet is hit having been struck by the batter? So um, I think maybe she's asking, would five penalty runs be awarded if it were buys, Abdullah? So the ball hasn't hit the pad, the ball hasn't been hit by the batter, uh, but has gone straight through the wicketkeeper mm -hmm. to the helmet. Uh, Cindy, thank you so much for your question. The law tells us that while the ball is still in play and the ball strikes the helmet of uh, the fielding side that they put behind uh, the keeper at any time while it's still in play, the ball will immediately become dead and five pen penalty runs shall be awarded to the batting side. So, so that is the guidelines that the that the law uh, gives us. Any time while the ball is in play, if it strikes the helmet behind the keeper, five penalty the ball is immediately becomes dead. Five penalty runs will be awarded to the fielding side. Also, runs completed by the batters before the the um, ball struck the helmet, uh, including the run. Um, if they crossed at the instant of the ball hitting the helmet, shall also, also be scored. So to answer your question, uh, it doesn't matter if uh, if the batter plays the ball. That's not the only that's not the only criteria for five penalty runs to to be given. If at any time the ball hits the helmet, whether it's the batter hitting the ball and then striking the 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 helmet. If the batter sold his arms and it didn't touch anything and goes through the keeper's legs and then it touched uh, the helmet behind the keeper, still dead ball, five penalty runs. Uh, even if the ball goes down to fine leg um, and the fine leg fielder uh, throws wildly to the uh, behind the keeper and from uh, and he, and the, the throw from the fine leg fielder struck uh, the helmet behind the keeper, ball also dead, five penalty runs. And, uh, needs to be awarded to the to the batting side. Uh, thanks, Tom. Perfect, Tula. Thank you for that very thorough answer. Um, next question also comes from Cindy, and it came up when we were talking about the answer to the one of the revision questions. It was the revision question where the bowler bowled from one and a half meter behind the um, bowling crease and uh, the word deceive came up and uh, Olumide actually said his answer comes from the question because um, there was deception by the bowler or attempted deception by the bowler. So Cindy asks, um, how do we decide if there has been deception or not? Abdullah. Uh, thanks for your question, uh, Cindy. So under Law 41, uh, Law 41.4 speaks about the when there is a deliberate attempt to distract the striker before the striker has received the ball. So the wording that the law that the law um, uses is he, uh, before the uh, before the striker had an attempt to play at the ball, did the uh, was there an attempt to distract the striker? Then law 41.5 speaks if there is deliberate distraction obstruction or deception after the ball was bowled to any of uh, the batters. So when we speak about the deception, deception 
comes into uh, law 41.5 where, where the um, fielding side after the ball uh, after the ball was delivered and then there was deception to the batters. So this, um, they, uh, uh, for many years, um, the word deception was not part of this particular uh, law, but since the, uh, about what happened uh, over the past 10 to 15 years, um, and I think you've seen it many times on, on, on TV or even at, at, at local club level, feel this, uh, and they call it mock fielding. So when do they do mock fielding? Fielders will do it when they try to deceive the batters from taking additional runs. So they'll mock field, um, they'll, they'll do a mock fielding. Um, and by doing this mock fielding, they're trying to give the impression to the batters that they've actually picking up the ball and now going to return it to the, the keeper or, or the bowler. So they're trying to deceive the batters from, from taking a, a second or taking additional uh, runs. So this is an example of a deception by the fielding side to, um, to, the, uh, to the batters after they've they've um, after the ball has been delivered and there are punishments that we need to give if the if the fielding side or the fielder did a, a try, attempt to deceive the batter or did try uh, mock fielding so that is an example of uh, deception by the fielding side and this fairly harsh uh, punishment punishment um, for it uh, tom did i answer a question I think I'll just add to that, uh, Abdullah, because I think um, Cindy is wanting to know how do we decide if there has been deception or not, and and it is a bit of a f uh, a judgment call from the umpires um, because we we need to basically know what the field is thinking and um, see if it comes out in in the actions being. Uh, intentional. Um, so yes, you don't punish um, sort of unintentional uh, acts, but you do punish uh, what you consider to be deliberate attempts to uh, deceive a batter. It will come with um, experience and it will also come with um, you judging sort of the match situation because you probably won't find a deliberate attempt to deceive a batter the first over of a day's play. Um, you know, those type of things usually come later on when the match is tight and um, a fielding side is maybe um, struggling and desperate to get a wicket so um, that's when they will try some some dirty tricks. So be aware as an umpire that players can be deceiving, but uh, you need to be um, judgmental as to when it's uh, a attempted deception versus um, a, um, let's say, unintentional mistake that uh, might lead to deception. Hope that answers your question, Cindy. Uh, last question on the chat box is from Varun. And Abdullah, you need to gonna have to close your eyes and visualize this one. Uh, a throw <laughs> coming in from the fielder lodges in the helmet of the striker who is busy with his second run. The striker then completes three runs. I'm assuming the ball is still lodged in the striker's helmet. When will the ball be called dead? And how many runs, if any, are scored? Interesting one. Do you need me to repeat the question, Abdullah, the scenario while um, you picture it? 
Yeah, we are, we are visualizing it. Uh, um, okay, I've, I've got it, Tom. Um, yeah, interesting one. Uh, never thought of this one, but um, I will have to apply. I will have to apply law um, uh, law twenty. I think it's twenty point one point five, which uh, which speaks about when the ball lodges in the equipment uh, of uh, the batter, the ball automatically becomes dead. So, I'll, uh, so for me in this case, I'll, uh, I'll apply that law. The moment that ball lodges, it will automatically uh, becomes dead. You will then have to judge uh, where where the batters were at the at the time. If they let's say they've completed uh, two runs and they've crossed uh, on the third, I'll then allow the three uh, the three runs for that particular delivery. So automatically dead as soon as that ball lodges in the in the helmet of the keeper of of the the striker, and I will allow whatever runs accrued, um, including if they cross at the instant of the ball lodging in the striker's helmet. Uh, will you apply it anyway in um, any other way else, Tom? I uh, know that sounds pretty fair to me, Dula. Uh, I was just wondering when exactly if you do allow that last run um but it makes sense to um award it if they have crossed um but if they haven't crossed then uh you wouldn't award that last run that is in progress i agree with you there uh we've had one more question come in on the chat box it's from herve uh, again, maybe uh, close your eyes and visualize this one, Abdullah. Uh, where the fielding side has a helmet on the field and it is placed slightly outside the line of the wickets, so not exactly behind the stumps. Uh, as an umpire, should I allow play to continue when the bowler starts his run-up? That's the first question. Um, now the bowler balls and the ball is down leg side it's a wide and goes to the boundary it does not touch the helmet what should i call thanks for your question Ervi. firstly good umpiring uh, technique is if you do not see that the helmet is in line with the with the stumps. Uh, please ask the keeper or or the slip to move it slightly. Uh, in this case, let's say slightly to to the left to make sure that it is behind the keeper. I, uh, uh, for me, that is uh, good umpiring technique. Then to answer your question, then the ball the bowler delivers the ball and it goes down. Uh, why down the leg side? It does not touch the helmet. So this will then be uh, four wide. So you need to signal four wide uh, to the scorer. So in total, uh, this will be five runs, one for the wide and four for, for the boundary. Did I answer the question, Tom? 100% Dula. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to all the participants this evening for another interactive session. I do not see any more questions in the chat box and I do not see any hands up in the room. So I'll take this opportunity to wish you all a pleasant evening. Uh, Bavesh has just put his hand up. Uh, Bavesh, please unmute your microphone and uh, the floor is yours. Sorry, Tom, <laughs> being a little bit late. I just have a question about uh, uh, this ongoing question of Mr. Harder where Abdullah has just answered about uh, 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 helmet belongs to the fielding team. Uh, uh, of course, we can ask the uh, field, fielding team to put the helmets in align with the, the, the strikers and stump which is a middle stump parallel to that. 
But even though if they do not keep in that area, it doesn't matter because the whole reason of keeping that, that ball will hardly reach to in that particular area. And if it hits to the helmet, then regardless where they place, it will automatically will be dead ball and the uh, batting team will award it with the five runs. That's correct, Pavesh. Um, it is their prerogative as to where they want to put the helmet. Um, but uh, nobody wants to give away five penalty runs. Um, so you can, as the bowlers in umpire, because you're in line with the stumps, mm -hmm. uh, can assist them if the helmet is not directly behind the stumps because it's not that easy for them to actually judge when they're putting it down uh, because they're quite far away from the stumps, whereas you at the bowler's end are right next to the bowler's end stumps, and you can see the line of the striker's end stumps, and um, following that, you can see the line where the helmet should be. Uh, but yes, having said that, if at any point in time the ball hits the Helmet behind the wicket keeper, um, five penalty runs will accrue to the batting side. Thank you, Tom. And I have a second question uh, about the no ball where we gone, gone through the slides. Uh, there was a one uh, slides where it was mentioned that it bounced more than once uh, and it stands still before and second bounce before the popping crease and the second no ball consider if the ball pitches at the edge of the pitch or or outside the pitch before uh, uh, before the strikers wicket what happened if the ball without pitching directly uh, 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 parallel to wicket uh, but it goes after the wicket, sorry, I will correct my question. What happened if the ball pitches outside the wicket, but not towards the wicket keeper, but on the side of the wicket? Do you consider as a dead ball at that time? Or do you still give a no ball or a white ball? Uh, Pavesh, where exactly has it pitched? Um, it's its ball pitches outside the striker's wicket. It's already crossed striker's wicket. Passed, okay. Yeah. And, yeah, it's, yeah. and it's wide. Yeah, it's wide, uh, far away from the, let's put it, the second wicket. Okay, perfect. You want to take that one, Abdullah? Uh, yes, Tom. Uh, so, so, Bavis, so before answering that question, let me just again emphasize uh, when the umpire should call and signal no ball. So if the bowler and the ball gets delivered, the bowler bowls the ball off the pitch and the ball lands before the striker's wicket. So mm -hmm. off the pitch, before the striker's wicket, call and signal no ball. So my understanding of your scenario is, and you can correct me, bowler bowls the ball off the pitch, but instead of landing before the striker's wicket, it now lands after the striker's wicket. Yeah, that's correct. Is, is, is that what you're asking? So in that case, Bavis, call and signal wide ball. So before the striker's wicket, no ball. After the striker's wicket, wide ball. Okay, Did you ask the question, it... Bavis? Yes, yes, you did, uh, Abdullah. But regardless, if the ball pitches not within the, uh, um, uh, how do you call it? not within the pitch of... Uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, yes, Bavis, uh, regardless. So uh, the law guides us here. The law tells us two criteria needs to be in place if you're going to call, uh, um, that allows you to call it a no ball. First criteria is off the pitch. Second criteria is lands before the striker's wicket. If both criteria in place, no ball. 
So in your example, only one criteria is in place. So it, yes, it is off the pitch, but it does not meet the second criteria where the ball needs to land before the striker's wicket. And because it doesn't meet the first criteria, um, um, both criteria, you cannot call it a no ball. So yes, it's off the pitch, uh, but you will call it a wide in your in in your example. Uh, did I answer your question, Bavis? Yes, Abdullah, but now I have another question related to the same thing. How about ballers accidentally deliver the ball, which is not pitching on, on the wicket, and it goes to directly to the third slip or the gully and pitching there? Do you still consider this consider as a white ball or do you consider as a dead ball? So if, uh, if you consider the ball that has been delivered um, by this, so that ball has been delivered. So you need to make a call, either wide ball or uh, either wide ball or no ball. If I can visualize this and it goes to to third slip, I think that ball is fairly high. I think that ball is above waist high. So that makes this call easier. I, this for me, this e for me, is a a um, a no ball. But again, you need to judge whether it is above uh, waist high. Uh, but Ball delivered, and even if it's not a waist out and it goes to third slip, as long as you consider that ball delivered and it's and even um, and it's wide, you can call it wide, or if it's high, you can call it no ball. Abdullah, if I can just come in there, Bavesh, I think yeah. you are wondering if the ball has slipped out of the bowler's hand, and the the answer here is if the ball has gone forward out of the bowler's hand then you shall consider it as a delivery. So it will either be a no ball for height or a wide. If the ball has gone backwards out of the bowler's hand, then you will call and signal dead ball. Uh, that answers. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Abdullah and Tom, for clarifying the doubts. You're welcome, Pavesh. Next hand up is Suhail. Suhail, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Hi, good evening, guys. Um, apologies, not a cricket question, more umpiring question. Um, sorry, I was not available for the first two because of club commitments. Um, with regards to coming up with a new season for umpiring, um, you know, you sent us an initial email with regards to preparation, mat preparation for the umpires. Um, I think I did send you an email, Tom, Do you, if you can recall, with regards to getting the equipment that the umpires will need in, in, the, in terms of getting ready for a match in South Africa. Um, can you maybe help me out with that? Because I've tried going around to to Total Sport and Hi-Fi, uh, Mr. Sports and things, and I was uh, unable to get some of those things. Unfortunately, I haven't tried, tried DP yet, but um, yeah, so I'll put my, put my sound off now. Okay, so um, thanks for the question. Sorry, I haven't got back to you on email. Um, most, if not all, of the equipment that uh, we use as umpires is available at Sportsman's Warehouse. Um, they've got a clicker, they've got heavy bells, they've got um, mark bowlers markers. Uh, what they don't have is um, bowling cards, which shall be handed out at our uh, first roundtable meeting which is on Tuesday the 27th of September you will receive notice of that um, meeting by an email from the secretary about a week before the meeting and uh, we also will hand out um, clothing to any new umpires who have stood uh, three matches or more if you have not yet stood three matches, then you need to get a white uh, cricket shirt, uh, also available at Sportsman's Warehouse. Uh, just make sure that it doesn't have any team logos on it. Uh, you need to have a white brim hat. Again, uh, make sure it doesn't have any team logos on it. Of course, it can have a Grey Nichols um, logo on it. Um, or any other brand, but just not team logos. And uh, obviously black pants, formal pants, you can buy those from any clothing shop or most clothing shops. 
and then uh, white shoes, preferably running shoes. Those are the most comfortable for me. Uh, what else am I missing? Um, we are now going to be holding uh, players caps and jerseys again. So what I use is a, uh, a, a paper binder. Don't know what the, the correct uh, word for it is. Uh, it's not a paper clip, but it's um, it's one of those that can clip a lot of, say, about 100 papers together. So that's what I use, uh, attach it to my belt or one of the belt buckles to um, to then put the bowler's cap on. Um, yeah, that's all the equipment I can think of. I'm not sure if I've left anything out that you don't know where to find, uh, but you will get all extra equipment that you can't get at Sportsman's Warehouse. You will get at our first meeting on Tuesday, the 27th of September. I hope that clarifies that for you, Sohail, and any other new umpires in the meeting. I see there are no more hands up, and we've now got a question in the chat box from Ivan de Jong. Third man fielder throws the ball into the wicket keeper who is wearing a helmet. On the second run, before they cross, the ball lodges in the helmet of the wicket keeper wearing the helmet. The wicket keeper struggling to get the ball out of his helmet and the batsman completes the second run. Does the ball become dead when it lodges in the wicket keeper's helmet or does play continue? Um, as long as the helmet is worn, Ivan, the ball stays alive. Okay, so similar to what we spoke about, if the ball lodges in a short leg fielder's helmet while that helmet is worn, then the ball is still alive. Okay, ball only becomes dead if it hits an unworn helmet. I hope that answers your question. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your participation this evening. I see we don't want it to end. Sachin, you've got your hand up. Please unmute your microphone and the floor is yours. Hey, hi, Tom. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. Tom, just a funny scenario there, uh, but uh, should the keeper put his head on the stumps? We should consider it as a run out if the batsman's out of this crease. I know the ball needs to be in the wicket keeper's hand, and the hand can then uh, knock over the stumps. Uh, not not the helmet knocking over the stumps, even if the ball <laughs> is lodged to the helmet. Okay, only the hand. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Sachin. Interesting one. <laughs> right. Are there any more questions in the chat box or any more hands? Going once, going twice. Good night, everybody. See you on Monday. Thank you and have a great weekend when it comes. Bye. Uh, good night, everyone. Bye. Good night, bye.